Hello, my name is Megan Hayden, and today I'm going to talk to you about Borrelia burgdorferi, also known as the causative agent of Lyme disease. The first thing I want to talk about is the morphology, or the shape, of the bacteria. Borrelia, in particular, is a spirochete, which means that it is spiral-shaped, and it has about 15 to 20 flagella under the first layer uh, which allows it to move through viscous material where other bacteria would be immobilized. Part of what makes Borrelia burgdorferi so scary is that it can change its own surface antigens. So it's essentially hiding in plain sight with a really bad disguise, but the immune system still doesn't recognize it. Another mechanism it has is the flagella, which I touched on a little bit earlier. Arguably the most dangerous and effective way of evading the immune system is through the formation of spheroplasts, which force the body to go into an inflammatory response that damages the body's tissues rather than actually killing the spirochete. It's sort of like a full-body fake-out of the immune system. Now let's talk about how we can actually get Lyme disease. You get it from being bitten by a tick but specifically the black-legged tick, which affects the northeastern part of the U.S., and then the western black-legged tick, which affects the western part of the United States. The western black-legged tick is also responsible for anaplasmosis, so watch out for that one as well. Ticks have a really unique way of acquiring Lyme disease and passing it on. It's through transidial transmission, something that I can never pronounce properly, but essentially they'd have to take a blood meal at every life stage in order to pass it on. During the larva stage, a tick will take a blood meal off of a reservoir host such as a rat, who may already be a carrier, and then they harbor the disease. Once the larva takes a blood meal, it molts, grows an extra pair of legs, and evolves into a nymph. Though slightly bigger than the larva stage, the nymph is still really small, which explains why most of the Lyme disease transmissions happen from bites of ticks during the nymph stage. The adult ticks are much larger in size, and they're pretty plump, so it's easy to see them and to take them off of your body uh, before they really do any damage. It takes a tick being attached for 20 hours before infection occurs. This dog right here is hosting a tick and he has no idea because it's so small, so we'll find out about that a little bit later. We know Lyme disease comes from ticks, but where's the bacteria in all of this? Where is it on the tick? Borrelia burgdorferi hangs out in the gut of ticks and then it travels to the salivary glands, so when you get bitten by a tick, a little bit of saliva gets in your system, and so does Borrelia. Once in the body, Borrelia uses glucose and other similar carbohydrates as its main energy source from mammals. I want to talk about hosts really quickly because we've already established that the vector or vehicle of Lyme disease is the tick, but what about the host? The first type of host is the reservoir host, as I mentioned earlier. It's could be birds or small rodents like mice or rats, and often these animals are carriers their whole lives and they don't really show any signs. Um, they just carry it. So they can provide a near constant blood meal for larva ticks. And the second type of host that I want to talk about is the incidental host, sort of like the final host for the tick. Uh, you see them a lot in dogs or humans, um, rarely in cats or cattle, uh, sheep. These type of hosts are not actually meant to be hosts, so they make pretty bad carriers because they actually get the disease and they experience all of the clinical signs. In this particular case, I'm going to tell you about Rufus, who is a very sweet dog. Uh, his favorite food is bacon, he really likes scrambled eggs on his birthday, and he also really loves to go hiking with his owner, Jack. And because Jack loves Rufus so much, whenever they go hiking, he just kind of lets Rufus go off the leash and run around, eat some twigs, you know, living the good life. They go out so frequently, he's so well-trained, he never thought it would be a big deal. 
no one had ever really talked to Jack about the dangers of Lyme disease, and so he had no idea that lurking in the grass was an itty-bitty nymph tick waiting to attach to somebody. As is very typical of ticks, it was hanging out on a very tall piece of grass, and as Rufus was walking by, the tick thought, you know what, I'm just going to jump on this tail. A few weeks later, Jack noticed that Rufus wasn't really acting like himself. He was super lethargic, he wanted to sleep all the time, he didn't want to go hiking anymore, which was weird because it used to be his favorite activity. But what really got Jack worrying was that he saw Rufus was limping. But what was really weird was that sometimes it wasn't always the same leg. When Jack went to go look at Rufus's leg, he also noticed this weird rash. All things considered, Jack was pretty worried. I mean, Rufus was super sleepy, he was limping, and he had this weird rash. He decided it was time to take Rufus to the vet. Once they got to the vet, Jack was pretty scared. He'd never seen Rufus this bad off. He looked terrible. But once the RVT started running some tests, they kind of had it pinned down. They asked Jack if Rufus had ever been vaccinated for Lyme disease. And Jack was like, wait, what's Lyme disease? The vet explained that Lyme disease is the most common vector-borne bacterial disease in the world. And... It's pretty common in dogs, actually, especially when they spend as much time outdoors as Rufus does. One of the tests they performed is called a SNAP test. It tests for a lot of things, heartworm, but it also tests for Lyme disease as well. So if we were to fill out a soap form, uh, this is roughly how it would look. Jack told the RVT that Rufus normally goes hiking a lot, but he just doesn't want to hike anymore. He normally has a lot of energy, but he's not playful anymore, and he sleeps a lot. You know, he's not eating as much. Um, His activity level is pretty low. He's pretty lethargic. Jack mentioned that Rufus still eats twice a day, so that's good. Um, He's not currently on any medications. He's not coughing, sneezing, vomiting. There's no diarrhea all good signs. Um, His main complaint was just that Rufus wasn't himself. He didn't want to go hiking, and that was a big part of who Rufus was. For the second part of the soap form, the objective section, uh, it is noticed that Rufus was very quiet, quiet and responsive. While taking his vitals, the RVT did notice that He had a bit of a fever, which is very common with patients who have Lyme disease. As far as other objective data, uh, sometimes animals don't really show all of the clinical signs, but if they are there, there uh, is often a distinct ring, like a rash, around the area where the tick injected its saliva, Um, But on some dogs with a lot of fur, it may not show up as uh, distinctly. And of course, other signs include the limping and the feverish symptoms. So poor Rufus has been suffering from Lyme disease, and Jack wants to know what treatment options there are. Luckily for Rufus, Lyme disease is frequently treated with an antibiotic known as doxycycline, And symptoms can improve in as early as 24 to 48 hours, so all hope is not lost. But of course, the best way to not get Lyme disease is to vaccinate your dog. Unfortunately, there are no human vaccines currently. But the next best thing is to keep your dog on a leash when going hiking outdoors. Make sure you stay on the path and avoid any brush. There's also the option of keeping an army of opossums. I found out while researching for this video that one possum eats about 5,000 ticks in one season. So I am 100% ready to breed my army of possums. On a more serious note, thank you so much for watching my video. I really hope you enjoyed it.